the book of Job, the ninth chapter, the 21st and 24th verses. I am blameless. I do not know myself. I loathe my life. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the eyes of its judges. If it is not he, who then is it?
two, I'm going to preach on a song, something I've never done before. Let us pray. Lord God, empty me of me and fill me only with you, so that the words of my mouth are all yours and not my own, and empty the hearts of the hearers so that they are filled with you and hear only what it is you are calling them here today. Lord, speak through me. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, words found in the Declaration of Independence. This phrase was used to express the unalienable rights given to all humans by their Creator. What is the pursuit of happiness? Well, I suppose we could turn to that 2006 movie starring Will Smith and his son that tells of the true story about a father who struggles to make a good life for him and his son. This meant he had to start from scratch with practically nothing, and he suffered many setbacks, eventually sometimes spending time in homeless shelters. With nothing to lose, he starts an unpaid internship in the hopes of moving up the ladder eventually. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, spoiler alert. Eventually, this hard-working, highly intelligent father founds his own investment firm and becomes quite wealthy. The pursuit of happiness is what we might refer to as the modern American dream, at least the one depicted in this movie. The one that thinks that you can acquire lots of money and possessions if you just put in a little bit of hard work. But why doesn't this bring happiness? The reality is nobody finds fulfillment or even sustainable happiness in this version of the American dream, despite many people having been able to achieve it. If you were to talk to people, though, who have an appreciation for life and a fulfillment in their lives, what you're going to find is that it is more likely because of the idea that they were able to improve the lives of future generations, not acquire material wealth and lots of possessions. Although these situations to the casual observer might appear similar, the reality is they are very different. Those who express this fulfillment and appreciation are progressing towards a purpose outside of themselves. This means that self-actualization, the highest state of human development on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where one reaches their fullest potential, is not found in one's own pursuit of happiness, but rather the pursuit of a higher purpose that lies outside of oneself. The psalmist today, in this psalm, is looking around at all of those who seem to be doing great. They seem to be finding this happiness in worldly things, as such as their prosperity, their perfect bodies, and their great health. He later then expresses his frustration because he who is upright and pure in heart has suffered greatly. But what the psalmist discovered, and what I am sharing with you today, is the pursuit of happiness is a myth. Happiness is so elusive. Many people pursue happiness and find themselves sorely disappointed. This is because life, especially Christian life, is not about the pursuit of happiness, but about finding meaning or purpose in life. 
for Christians as paralleled by this psalmist through the discovery. Meaning comes from faith in God. And as Christians, our purpose is to living lives faithfully to Christ and Christ's actions. All too often, them. Many well-intentioned Christians find themselves trying to pursue happiness in Christ. Many good Christians think that if they just get to this point in their spiritual journey where all things seem to come together just as they should, and they hit that spiritual rhythm, that everything's just going to work out. But that goes against the message of the cross. It is contrary to what Jesus teaches in this reading from John read today in verse 33, where Jesus says, you will face persecution. Now the Greek word used here in that translation says persecution, but it can also be, also be translated in multiple ways, such as trials, tribulations, suffering, distress. In other words, Jesus is saying, that for Christians, life will be about suffering. Now this is partly because as Christians, we are called to share and care in the pain of those who are suffering. What Jesus is getting at is that the pain and suffering is the norm, not the exception. Now, in many traditions, there's this understanding that the absence of pain and suffering equals happiness. But I think, though, that the psalmist and Jesus are trying to get at it. This is the definition of happiness, then do not pursue it. <clears throat> As Christians, we need to confront pain, not avoid it. Pain and suffering is often where the most richest aspects of our faith can occur. For example, there was a test done in a very large Presbyterian church where congregants were given a list of nine words from joy to failure. And they were asked to chart the points in their life that were most meaningful. Now what was interesting is that very few people said that everything was going well for them their whole lives. In fact, most people noted that the most meaningful points in their lives related to past times of suffering. Now we know that Jesus directly confronted pain again and again, oftentimes experiencing human pain so as to be able to relate care, and die for all humans. <coughs> As I suggested, pain and suffering is often where the most spiritual growth occurs. This means that for Christians to have meaning and purpose in life, we need to confront that pain. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that you live this ascetic life and minimize all of your possessions. What I am saying is, let life happen and pursue Christ. Because if you let life happen, as Jesus said, suffering will occur. But it is in those times that we are to realize how weak and frail we are and of our need for Jesus to carry us through. The biblical text reveals that God, more than anything else, uses suffering as an instrument to direct, guide, and change a believer's path in hopes of helping them see their calling. Now a good example of what I'm trying to get at here is a story that was shared with me from a friend who's a cyclist who explained to me that a good cyclist knows that there's always lots of headwinds coming when you're cycling. But occasionally you get that tailwind that comes behind and can offer some relief. But a good cyclist also knows that you don't become a better rider in the tailwinds. Rather, it is in the headwind that your skills develop the most. 
when moments of suffering arise. You want to head into the suffering and use them as an opportunity for growth in your faith. As Christians, we also need to be like that woman at the well, who at first wanted this living water that Jesus was telling her about so that she didn't have to come to the well and that she could avoid those people who were going to cause her suffering because they knew of her past. But when she finally understood what Jesus was saying, that he was the living water, and she grasped it fully in her heart, she ran to share that news with the very people she was trying to avoid in the first place. As the psalmist and the woman at the well realized that as Christians, it is in suffering we can often find meaning and purpose, which can eventually bring spiritual growth and a different health kind of happiness, one that we will speak more of next week. But the psalmist was right in that proverb in verse 1. It becomes true. God is good to the pure in heart. The psalmist, by his own testimony, provides a different way of grasping this Christian truth that can so easily be misconstrued. Now, upon entering the sanctuary, sanctuary where this psalmist anticipated, meditating on this conundrum that he was experiencing, it says he perceived the presence of God with him, and he was filled with great joy. Something that he referred to those wicked people were not able to perceive. Now, what he discovered is that meaning and joy come from recognizing God's presence, especially in his times of suffering. The goodness of God is not defined by the world's understanding of happiness. Rather, and it is not defined by the affliction suffered by the pure in heart. The real misery of life is to be far from God. The everlasting joy, the everlasting happiness, the true happiness comes from being near to God. Let us not pursue happiness, but pursue meaning and purpose through a closer relationship with God, today and every day. For the sake of the gospel and the sake of the world.